Canadian Forces Station CARP, or CFS CARP, nicknamed the Diefenbunker, was a top-secret communications base for over 30 years located on the outskirts of Canada's capital of Ottawa, Ontario. Between 1961 and 1994, the site's exact purpose was kept from the Canadian public. Known as the Central Emergency Government Headquarters, the bunker was intended to house Canada's government and communications in the event of a nuclear attack by the Soviet bloc during the Cold War. The site was built in secrecy in less than 18 months between 1959 and 1961. CFS CARP was decommissioned in 1994 after its 32 years of continuous operation and was declared a National Historic Site that same year. Former staff and local volunteers rallied to preserve the site, and ultimately, the city purchased the bunker. Although its furnishings and equipment had been stripped when the military left, volunteers began offering tours of the bunker, and the museum was officially founded in 1997. The Diefenbunker's mandate is to increase throughout Canada and the world interest in and a critical understanding of the Cold War by preserving the Diefenbunker as a National Historic Site and operating a Cold War Museum. So, today on History in Austria, we're visiting the Diefenbunker, Canada's Cold War Museum, and thinking about the stories that matter most when teaching Cold War history. Along with me is a friend and fellow student of history, Lewis Reedwood. I'll let him introduce himself. Hello, I'm Lewis Reedwood. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto in history, and I'm the host of Off Campus History, which is a history podcast, which will have a tie-in episode with History in Austria on the Diefenbunker. During our visit, Lewis and I were able to speak with the Diefenbunker Museum's visitor experience manager, Sean Campbell. You'll hear Sean's voice in today's episode, both in our interview with him and in the museum's audio guide, which we were generously given permission to borrow from. The Diefenbunker is a four-story bunker with the uppermost level referred to as the 400 level and the bottom level referred to as the 100 level. There's a model of the bunker on display on the 400 level, as explained in the audio guide. Planners used the scale model of the bunker during the design and construction phases. The model was vital in planning how all the self-contained life support systems and power generation would fit and work in the four-story building, all completely underground. Different colors represent different ventilation and machinery systems. More than a thousand workers built the almost 1,000 square meter bunker over the course of 18 months. The main structure required 24,320 cubic meters of hand-poured concrete and sits on 1.5 meters of compacted gravel, which would have absorbed the shock of a nuclear blast. It was almost impossible to keep the building of the bunker a secret. Many residents in CARP wondered at what was being constructed. The public was told it was a communication center, but right from the start, people started calling it the Diefenbunker after the sitting Prime Minister, John Diefenbaker. Today, guests enter the bunker through the blast tunnel. From there, the bunker is laid out with its exhibit spaces on the 400 level, along with the decontamination showers, medical centre and emergency radio room, among other rooms. The sleeping quarters, recreation area, and most government rooms and offices are on the 300 level, and the cafeteria and mess area are located on the 200 level and the vault is on the 100 level. Within these four stories, government and military officials and staff would have lived, worked, eaten, and had leisure time. And if it came to the worst, awaited burial in the morgue located on the 100 level. Sean explains that while the physical infrastructure today is much the way it would have been when the site was decommissioned, there were some changes between the 60s and 90s. You know, as you say, infrastructure changes happen in the event that the bunker did have to activate as an emergency headquarters for the government, then everything on the 300 level would have been, that's where the action is, that's where everything's happening. So they moved all of our communications down onto the 300 level to reflect the area where we're going to keep this 
as close away from the daily operations as possible because we know that this is the most important aspect of the site. Mm -hmm. um, so things like that had to be done. So a lot of renovations had to be done on the 300 level. At the same time, another thing was over the course from the 60s until it closed in 1994, like this site was created, it, is a it was a working military base, so you did have personnel who were staying on site. But as you found that the psychology of those who were working on the site, you know, they didn't notice that some people who didn't extend their stays here up to the month, that it would have been, you started encountering things like something that people unofficially called mold syndrome, mm -hmm. where people would be underground for such an amount, such an amount of time that it would start to affect them, you know, physiologically and their, you know, that their mental health was, was something that needed to be kept in mind. So, you started seeing a shift away in the mid to late 70s and into the 80s, where it was that personnel were staying offsite and then coming in. So the majority of personnel would have come from around the area of Upland Air Force Base and other areas around the Ottawa. Um, so you had that going on. And then, you know, just daily renovations would have happened. Uh, for instance, when you go into the cafeteria, that was the color scheme as it would have been in the 1980s at the same time that the OSAX renovation was going on. So the changes were made to reflect the times as it was changing, but at the same time, you know, the, the function of the site remained the same. Because the site has been preserved and staged as it would have been when in operation, we as guests are invited to step into the shoes of the men and women who worked here and also imagine how the space would have functioned in the event of nuclear war. As Sean told us, the building is, in a way, frozen in time. I think it was known unofficially that the site itself was being scaled down as early as the 1970s. When the building was created initially, the planners had designated the fact that the site was only meant to last for 25 years, from 1961. So technically in 1986, we had already become obsolete. Uh, actually, funny enough, is 1962 when intercontinental ballistic missiles were first tested by the Russians. That's also when we knew that we were kind of, you know, because it was, our site was initially created as a means of protecting against a five megaton blast from 1.8 kilometers away from the site. But because of intercontinental ballistic missiles, if there was more of a direct attack, then our site really couldn't resist anything like that. So it, uh, yeah. The site still had its intended purpose up until the 1980s, but then closer to, you know, once the Cold War, you, you saw that the Cold War was starting to come to a close and the Berlin Wall came down and everything, they started seeing the writing was on the wall in terms of the space being a little bit, it, it's, it's almost as if your, your thesis is our, is our structure frozen in time. Yeah. And so in a way, it, it, it kind of is in terms of, you know, you, you, you see the way the things that have moved and that our infrastructure, it can only withstand a five megaton blast from 1.8 kilometers away. And we know how far advanced nuclear weaponry has advanced at this point. So the site at that point, because things had advanced so rapidly, um, there's, there's, a, there's a, a story about, and you'll encounter it when you go down onto the, the 300 level, it talks about when Prime Minister Trudeau came in the 70s, and um, he he was the he's the only sitting prime minister that ever walked through the site or toured the site. And after he left, he cut the funding budget to the site in half. Oh wow! So I think it was you know they they saw the site for its purpose, but at the same time, I think that you know it's it's kind of the same thing where it's a it's a piece of government infrastructure that over time you know it was just it was. It, again, it comes to that obsolete aspect of it after its construction and then the 1980s. Um, you know, it was just, uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's like that not only the infrastructure wasn't able to keep up, but mm -hmm. like the technology, like going through Absolutely. computers and stuff, hasn't changed over time really as much, as quickly as it has elsewhere. Exactly. So the building and the technologies it once housed quickly became obsolete and, after funding cuts, was eventually decommissioned. This might have been where the story ended, but as Sean describes, local community members had other ideas for the bunker when it went up for sale. 
So once the site was essentially when the site closed in 1994, the building was empty because Crown Assets came in and took everything. Mm -hmm. So we still had all of the bones that you have around us now, but none of the furniture or anything was inside. So the site was eventually so, like you had so many people who were, who were bidding to to come into the site and occupy the site. Um, but what ended up happening was that the city, the city ended up purchasing it, and then an intrepid group of volunteers, um, they partnered with them, and then they gave informal tours of the site, just around and speaking with military, former military personnel, people who were on site, and they gave those tours from 1994. And you know, as things were galvanized, and interest started to build. They said to themselves, "Well, we can create an organization out of this. We could, we can create this as a living site that people can come to and." And walk through the space, and so you know the efforts were were done as as create a museum. It was already designated as a historic site, but they wanted to have have the space open to the public to come on a regular basis and have tours done. And it was you know it was the foresight of volunteers that had the living memory of they had lived through the Cold War and they could appreciate what the site meant and stood for, and their their ability to convey that in the tours that they gave and from everything that they heard from the personnel was, uh, you know, I, I think that will serve the case for maintaining the site. And as Sean explains, these volunteers' perspectives continue to be an important part of the museum interpretation today. Yeah, so I'm wondering, because you're talking about it's kind of starting the interpretation of the site mm -hmm. with volunteers walking people through. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that influenced how you created interpretive materials. I, I can speak to when we were going through the process of having the panels created and the audio tour created. And one of the things that really guided us was that we we spoke to those volunteers who started. We, we made sure to incorporate their narrative, but also the fact that in 2012, we had um, a Digital Museums Canada grant to be able to digitize the oral histories of people who worked on site. So one of the main things that, that when we were going through uh, the creation of the audio guide is I wanted to create a sense of you are walking alongside the people who are working here and have their voices at the same time. And so you can go to the message control center, you could go to building the bunker, you could go down to the cafeteria area, and somebody who worked in those spaces will tell you exactly what it was like to work in them, odd tidbits and stories, and, and, just, and just general views that you know incorporates into the visit so that people come away with that understanding, not of text that just explains what it is, but how it was and how it was interpreted by people who work here. Yeah, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. It was the best mess I had ever eaten in. The food was always good, it was always hot, and if you didn't like what was on the menu, they'd make you something else. Uh, I think a lot of people got spoiled by the meals here. It was the best mess I'd ever eaten in. It was supposedly psychologically damaging to us to live in here. And that's why you'll see in some of the columns there, there were gray and white stripes and all the different colors. They had a special psychologist come in and pick colors and everything. That would happen just before I got here. And then more pleasant from not having windows. Clack, 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 and there's this tape shooting out and it's piling up on the ground. And you've got to stand in there with your, you know, your military boots on and try not to tear any of it. Because if you are, you're tearing a message in half and God help you because you can't splice it back together. There was no room for mistakes. You had to know what you were doing. And uh, it was sort of... Uh, it was nerve-wracking the first two or three times. But after you had a few test runs and a few especially the real power failure where we had a humongous storm outside and all of a sudden everything would just go black. Um, it was a shock to the system. And sometimes these, these flash messages came in very, very rapid succession. They might be air, they might be submarines, and sometimes a lot of it was done just to test us to see if we could deal with it. It was done, done by the Russians on purpose to agitate us. They might cite Russian aircraft that intruded into our space. We called them bears. Uh, a Russian bear was a type of aircraft just loaded with electronic equipment. Just loaded. They're watching us and we're watching them. That's the Cold War. Watching all the time. But we managed to have a few uh, exercises, mostly lasting, I think it was 36 to 48 hours. 
and which we would practice what would happen in the event of a nuclear war in Canada. We're simply trying to practice the flow of information because our job is basically flowing information from outside sources and from sources we had here, analyzing it, collating it, and presenting it to cabinet so cabinet can make whatever decisions it uh, had to make at the time. Hey, I mean, it was, it was work, you know, it was like anywhere else. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of people put things into the context that aren't really there. It's, it's like, it's a working environment. The perspectives offered by those who formerly worked here add something really important and really powerful to the way the museum teaches about the experience of the Cold War. When I did my first tour of the site, I remember I was in the CBC studio and the tour guide was in Frank Jeffrey, who was one of the founding volunteer guides on the site. And he explained what the CBC radio room was for. All radio stations across Canada, all of their lines at any point where there was emergencies were cut to the station and one single message would have been played out across the country. And then he turned the knob. And if you go down there and you turn the knob, you can hear this radio message, and it explains that there is a nuclear attack on Canada. Please take shelter. Please listen for the following instructions. This is a real emergency. I repeat, this is a real emergency. This is the Canadian Emergency Broadcasting System. An enemy attack on North America has been detected. Sirens are now sounding or have sounded the attack warning. Listen for further instructions. I don't know why it was listening to that that that's when it hit home for me, the purpose of the site. And all of the questions started flowing out of that. So there's that one area. But then when you go into the prime minister space, one of the things that we highlight both in the text panel and in the audio guide is the fact that if you were designated as a member of personnel on site, if you had to come here, then it was just you. And you have to think about everything that's going on above as you're doing your job. And we have multiple people, um, people who worked on the site, especially on the audio guide. When you listen to it, you can hear it in the voice when they talk about the fact that I may never hear or see my family again. And one of them says they'd be ashes. The other thing was always in my mind when I got married, I might have to come in here and never see my wife again or see my young baby boy because you would have to report for duty. If there was a threat, you might never see them again. They'd be ashes. It was in your mind. It had to be. Because that was the way things were put to you then. Would you come in and leave your family? Or would you stay with your family? And that was, you know, we we asked that question of many people and said, what would your dilemma be? Would you come in to protect the site and work the communications? Or would you stay with your family? And I think it was about 50-50 what the guy said. Because they said if it's a nuclear attack, basically the only ones that are going to survive are the ones in the bunker. And that just, <laughs> I yeah. remember when I was going through and I was doing the research, I said, oh my God, that's a powerful line. Yeah. You know, that's, that's and, and I'm sure that that was on, on everybody's mind when they, were, when they were working on site. The Diefen Bunker exists in the way it does today because the people who once worked here recognize the value of the site and work to preserve it and their stories about their time here for future generations. But as the museum has grown, they've looked for ways to include more perspectives on site and to provide additional services for their community. On the day we visited, the museum was throwing a toddler Halloween hunt, but they also host escape games, events, and feature artist in residence exhibits. Um, well, I, I think that's the best example. You know, we've set up today for um, our toddler Halloween hunt, so that the kids go around, and you know, it's 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 a chance for families to come around in the space, and we we want we want to be able to create those opportunities for members of the community, you know, the greater capital region, to come in and to just you know, we do have our main messaging when you come to the site, but we are part of the community. And what better way to, to, to reach out and to do things that the community may find interesting? But it's just outside, you know, it's, it's, it's loosely connected, but at the same time, things that are just fun, you know, for people to come through and really enjoy themselves when they come through the site. Um, and at the same time, um, uh, for, for our community, uh, Artists in Residence is one of those programs that we launched um, to be able to bring in 
I, you know, we have our interpretation of the site, but we know that so many other people may have different interpretations of the site. So, for instance, um, this coming this coming Saturday, uh, well, next Saturday, um, our artist and residence is going to be opening up. Um, their name is Mari Grafite. Um, and so what they're going to do is they've looked at the history of cartography during the Cold War and what the, the Canadian government designated as crucial infrastructure and what crucial areas were meant to safety were meant to safeguard in the event of nuclear attack or invasion. But it's not reflective of Indigenous perspectives. So when we heard their proposal to come in, look through archival materials, look through the cartography, and what they've done is they've managed to replicate what the government created, but they've managed to flip it on its head and have it so that it's an Indigenous perspective. And have it so this is what Indigenous people would deem crucial infrastructure, what they would deem crucial resources in the event of a disaster. And so that's a way of like rethinking it. And what we're going to do is we're going to have this sort of a, um, you know, a, a compare and contrast to what it is that that being deemed as critical things in the event of a disaster. And they're both going to be talking to each other in the same gallery space. And we welcome those conversations, you know, that's, that's, these are things that in order to feel, you know, to feel current and to feel that people can come in and have those discussions, like these are real time things that we're, you know, people want to know about or discuss and, you know, to be able to facilitate that space for the community to come in and talk about it is very important to us. So while the Diefen Bunker is an important site in its own right, as a unique space that invites visitors to look behind the curtain at Canada's emergency preparedness measures from the Cold War era, the aspects of it that, for me, are the most significant are the ways the museum has embodied the experiences of those who once walked these halls, and also how it's responded to the changing demands of its community. If you want to learn more about the Diefen Bunker, you can find additional resources at the links in the description, including links to the museum's full audio guide, which is available in eight languages, as well as virtual tours. However, I highly recommend stopping in if you have the chance, because visiting the space, to use Sean's metaphor, is kind of like seeing a band live rather than hearing a recording of them. There's really no way to fully recreate the experience online. If you'd like to hear more about my impressions of the museum and come with me behind the scenes, be sure to check out episode 10 of the Off Campus History podcast with my friend Lewis Reed Wood. In this episode, Lewis and I chat about our visit to the Deepen Bunker, the reasons I make these videos, and the things we'd love and hate about museums. Thanks to Hannah Cooley, who filmed our visit to the Deepen Bunker, and to Lewis Reed Wood for consulting on this episode. Clips from the audio guide are courtesy of the Deepen Bunker, Canada's Cold War Museum, and a special thanks to Sean Campbell and Jordan Vetter for their time and contributions. Our theme music is by Broke for Free. You can learn more at brokeforfree.bandcamp.com. One, two, three.